Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review. My written and video review series, take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the campaign expansion bundle, Yawn Adventure Bundle for the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, designed by Dan Con for Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition. This review has been sponsored by the publisher, and a review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you are interested in a sponsored review, please reach out via email, Twitter, or Discord, or my submission form at roguewatson.com. And if you enjoy my content, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping, supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. So if you've been uh, paying attention and watching some reviews, you know that this is actually the third in a series of adventure bundles designed for the uh, official 5e campaign, The Wild Beyond the Witchlight. And the previous two covered the previous two chapters in that adventure. So that adventure is... Uh, divided up uh, between chapter one, we get to the uh, carnival where we're then teleported into the Fey realm of Prismere. And from there, you realize that the realm, uh, the Fey wild realm, has been divided into three separate realms, each ruled by a different hag. And each of these adventure bundles uh, either expands and or adds entirely new adventures to those specific regions. So we've already seen the uh, adventure bundles for Hither. And the one for Thither, and now this is the third one, which is called Yawn. And this one includes uh, the bundle, at least, which means you're getting another three-in-one review from me. Includes three uh, separate adventures, which you can buy a la carte or a part of the bundle, which is Astronomer's Throne, Corrid Clans, and Mill in the Mist. These all take place in the uh, Chapter 4 of The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, which means I believe they're all designed for around level 6 to 7-ish. I think we're in pretty solidly Tier 2 by the time we make it to uh, Chapter 4. This is kind of the mountainous, uh, stormy region. The others were a swamp and a forest, respectively. And like the other bundles, you know, the designer does a really great job at, at um, analyzing what's already in this adventure and seeing what is maybe underdeveloped and could be made more interesting by, you know, featuring more interesting content for it. And uh, I think it does a, they do an excellent job here because, uh, especially with Chord Clans, which is really incredible, taking a, a section of the adventure which you know is probably just like a page maybe in the actual campaign book where you go talk to these this race of uh kind of rock gnome dwarf creatures uh and you just gain uh, you you learn of a feud between them and the Briganox, and you can kind of you know through a bunch of social role playing essentially just bring these clans together fairly easily at least according to the book and uh then they can help you with a revolt and go attack the hag and here it adds another obstacle where it includes, hey, what if you actually had to do things to help them first? Similar to how you had to help uh, the Peter Pan-like character, I forgot the name, uh, in the in the Hither Adventure, uh, Hither or Thither, the second one, Adventure Bundle, uh, where it basically gave you additional obstacles. So you don't automatically get to just do the thing when you arrive and somebody's like, oh, yeah, of course I'll help you. Instead, they basically demand you help them first. Give me, you know, here's a quest. And now once you complete it, uh, we can go uh, and complete this campaign together um let's talk about astronomer's throne first so this is a one-off uh location in yawn that's basically just a very simple there's this throne uh kind of made out of stone i guess that's right beneath the starry skies and you can sit on the throne and there's this brief little event that happens your mind's expanded you go to like a another realm and you basically just gain a new proficiency and a skill which is great but one character can do that just whoever you know risks doing it can do it that's the entire thing. That's it. It's like a little bit of a blurb of like, hey, it's it's kind of technically almost like a random encounter, but just not, you know, obviously a combat encounter or anything. So uh, instead, what this one does is expand that to turn that initial uh, transporting to the dream world thing into an actual puzzle, which is pretty cool because it's a riddle puzzle, which I think can go over very well with D&D parties if you make it, you you know, for design philosophy in D&D, &D, I think you have to err on the side of making it a little bit easier. Um, at least don't make the solution very obtuse. Make it so the players can figure it out. And, you know, obviously you should know your players and know if they're going to enjoy that kind of thing or not. But I, it, it is very hard to design good puzzles uh, for a tabletop RPG. And I, I do think that the two big puzzles which are introduced in this bundle, the other one is in Chord Clans, are both very, very well done. And this one, it's deciphering a riddle to basically trying to figure out, okay, what does the riddle mean in, in regards to where we have to point this telescope to each constellation? And we do get a separate map that includes um, this constellation. The one you see right here is the one with the solution already drawn in. That's obviously not the one that you would give to your players. 
Uh, but they get to cl uh, clearly see all these different constellations in the sky and then they use the riddle to kind of point the telescope to different things that's awesome i think that's a great puzzle very fun i can see that going over very well and then you are teleported to this fun basically boss arena right here the dream star sanctum there's this backstory written about how this dragon fell in love with the uh the original wizard who i believe is in the wild beyond which which light is just a side contest like oh it's his throne and he ascended to the stars and he's dreaming whatever um, in this case, the, you don't really have to know about any of that, except the, uh, this dragon is in the slumber because she misses her friend and, uh, the hag has decided to take advantage of things by saying, okay, dragon, I'll let you sleep and I'll make sure, you know, you don't dream badly or anything. And of course that's not what happens. Instead, she captures these nightmares and uses that to basically create the storms around yawn. So that's a big deal. If the party can actually solve, uh, this location, you can kind of, quiet down the ongoing constant thunderstorms in this region, which is why it suggests, hey, maybe you should actually do this one later in the adventure because those storms, you know, maybe could be a, a fun challenge. Um, so that can be an interesting adventure hook if the players realize that's what they need to do. My only slight misgiving is it's kind of difficult to determine if they don't have that information, like why would they get teleported to this realm? And why would they know immediately, like, we need to help this dragon? Um... And in order to help them, we have to uh, destroy these crystals, which are capturing her nightmares, basically. And uh, there's a, you don't have to fight the dragon itself. You're actually supposed to, the dragon can help you whenever it has a certain initiative rating. Instead, there's a beholder creature called a goth, which is a certain kind of beholder variant that eats magic items, which you can feed it magic items if you want to keep it happy. I don't think most parties are going to do that. And the thing it just you know, like a certain magic items only give it like a certain amount of time where it's satiated so most parties are just gonna fight this thing but it's a cool boss arena because there's special rules while you're fighting around this arena uh every time you destroy one of these crystals not only does the uh the goth get bonuses or or, or the players might get uh debuffs from being near the crystals but once they destroy the crystal that actually uh permanently buffs the uh beholder so it gets a it's a very dynamic cool boss fight and how the environment works in relation to uh this battle so that's pretty cool and as i mentioned the dragon can even uh in fact it's like a layer action it says while sleeping on initiative count 20 the dragon takes one of the following actions it can like banish somebody to a dream realm or actually uh it, 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 it's supposed to be kind of helping them because the idea is you want to help the dragon so it can kind of save people you know it can end like bad conditions that are on them like paralyzation and things so I think it's a really cool setup, assuming you're kind of open with the information of what the party should do, or at least make that uh, information, you know, available for them to glean. Uh, but otherwise, it's it's very fun. I like the one two hit combo of the puzzle and then the boss fight arena. And I think the boss fight arena itself is very, very interesting with the, the cool way it appears. And that's the whole thing. Like, that's the length of adventure you're going to get with all of these. Just a perfect, you know, it's not meant to be its whole new quest or anything. It just takes, again, the, the seed of an idea. Um, which is usually just the barest of seeds in the actual campaign book and then turns it into a more substantial like this could last an entire session kind of a deal in fact i think all of these would at least be a session if not longer uh and that's even a standard session not even just my short two and a half hour sessions horde clans is the second one this one is um i think this is my favorite it's the one i was most impressed with because it, it does the most amount of work to an area that again was so underdeveloped which is it's a classic Hatfield McCoy. There's these two warring factions that are fighting each other, and they both basically think the other one is working for the hag, when in fact you can easily come in and just say, hey, n neither of you are working for the hag. You should work help me, and we can go overthrow the hag together, and that should go over very well. And the designer says that's, you know, too easy. That's, we should throw up some more obstacles, and maybe the players have to, you know, the, the Brigand Knock Mine is already a pretty thorough place that's got, um, you know, it's almost its own dungeon crawl. In fact, I would have loved the designer to take a stab at that one, but I can understand it already had a pretty good development as it is, just because I like it when the designer does the maps and stuff for me. Um, and here, there was really not much with the Korid clans, which is, uh, they were home in that kind of Stonehenge area. And it even mentions in the book that there are eight different clans. Each one is part of a different um, type of, like there's the Granite clan and the Basalt clan and the Chalk clan. You know, it's a different kind of rock material. And as it is, only two of them actually give you the quest to go hey, go to the Brigand Knox and uh, deal with, basically deal with our feud with them, essentially. Um, or, you know, stop them from being with the hag, and it turns out they're not. Um, and here it says, well, what if, yes, you still had that quest, but what if the six other clans also all had quests for you to do? So what this does is it adds six new quests 
uh, for you to undertake. And it says in order for you to uh, win over the all the Chord clans together, you need to help at least six of the eight. Now, if you go and unite the Briganox and figure that whole thing out, then you've already got two. So you technically only have to do four of these. But you could do all of them, and it says if you fail some, maybe you could do a partial one, maybe only some of the chords can help you, and that kind of thing. So I think that's really cool. And all of these do a great job of giving you pretty wildly different things to do. It's not all, um, you know, a standard fetch quest or a standard go kill this monster quest. They all involve a, a pretty good variety, and they all have their own maps, which is pretty fun. So we really get a lot of content with this one. Um, I'll run through them real quick. One of them, you save a bunch of Corrid kids who accidentally steal eggs from a salamander. Now, initially when I thought salamander, I was like, okay, wait, just like, no, it's the salamander stat block is, of course, the big, cool uh, lava living, um, almost looks like an anthropomorphic snake kind of a creature. Uh, and these Corrid kids got over their heads and basically thought they were stealing like gems or things. It turns out to be a salamander egg. So it can be a, 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 a combat encounter. In fact, there's a whole battle map for it. Very cool battle map. And, or it could be a social encounter where you convince the salamander, hey, 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 it's okay, we'll get your eggs back, which, of course, they're in another clan that you can go and visit. We'll get the eggs back, please don't kill, and it can be kind of a social thing, which I appreciate that, so that's pretty fun. The Flint clan, um, they are blaming the Briganox for having just a bunch of um, attacks on them, but it's all like little biting, stinging attacks, and that should clue the player into like, hey, maybe it's just a bunch of bugs. And it turns out you just have to destroy an infestation of mites, which is this kind of unique fairy insect creature in this world. Uh, and once you clear out those mites from a hidden place, then you've solved their issue. <laughs> so pretty straightforward. Uh, the Granite Clan, I love this one. They're a bunch of jocks. Uh, they just are into like Olympic Games and, and Gladiator, uh, what do you call it, the battles and stuff. So here you can uh, join in the Granite Games. And basically it's a bunch of uh, kind of competitive skill checks where you just try and participate and do really well. And there's a bunch of complications that are included with the rock climbing competition, which I think is really fun. Essentially, you just have to do well enough to earn the, uh, you know, approval of the Granite Clan, and then you've solved their, you know, quest. Um, the Obsidian Clan is similar, except instead of with uh, a friendly athletic competition, it is a very unfriendly dueling uh, that you have to perform. In this case, a one-on-one -on -one duel with one party member and the leader of the Obsidian Clan. There's a cool backstory here where the leader, because they're the only ones that produce, like, warriors of the Korids, actually went to the hag, Endolin, who rules over Yawn, and said, hey, this isn't cool what you're doing to the Korids. And Endolin cursed him to say, well, you'll, we'll both rule the same way then, which, of course, turned him into just a cruel, evil, horrible leader. And there's an interesting thing where the players might be able to tell, and they can obviously ask others that, hey, he's actually corrupted under a champ, and he's not supposed to, like, kill, like, you're supposed to, like, challenge people, and it's a friendly match and all that. But instead, he's, like, very cruelly, like, killing people that, you know, try and duel him and all that. But the players, every time they attack him, he has to roll a save, and then he can actually be knocked out of it, or the players could just also defeat him if they wanted to. Um, but that would probably require a little bit of a more work for them to win over the Obsidian Clan. The Marble Clan is a, uh, a it's a basically a skill challenge to produce a work of art. And the way I thought of it, I, the way I would run this is like a high school science fair project where it's like competing against other teams. It doesn't mention that in the case of here. It doesn't go into the weeds too much about um, the entire competition. But you're basically just trying to create a work of art and scoring victory points, almost like a board game. Uh, by making skill checks. So, but the party should be allowed to, you know, you can cast spells or whatever you want to try to make it fun. Just kind of open it up and allow the players to make whatever they want. I'm sure a lot of parties will end up with just a giant rock penis or something, you know, parties are. But, hey, as long as you have fun with it, then that's that's how you, you do. And I think that could be a fun one. Again, they're all so different in how they do. And then the Slate Clan is a giant puzzle. It's a sliding block puzzle, which I know a lot of video game people will be rolling their eyes on it. But I think having a sliding block puzzle once in a while is totally fine. And I think, again, this is a puzzle that could go over pretty well because it's not too cumbersome. You just have to decipher the fact that all these notches is how many of the spaces you should have in each one. And because it's so, oh, you know, a lot of sliding block puzzles, they have the one space you have to move around. It's just a pain in the butt. Uh, this time there's a lot of open spaces. So you can literally just slide things around pretty easily. And the designer, thankfully, included as a separate handout a blank version of this puzzle that just has the blank spaces and then the actual um, squares that you can fill in so you can totally configure it however you want and I'm even thinking as somebody who plays on a VTT like Roll20 you can include that as a map and then include all those squares as tokens and then your players can move that around and align things and that could go over pretty well it may, may take them seconds to figure out what the right solution is but whatever it's still going to be fun for them to physically move the things around and solve the puzzle and then thus they've uh, it, the, the puzzle box actually full of a uh, as a magic item inside they can get, but also just wins over the Slate Clan. So 
I really, really liked the Quarried Clans one just because I loved the amount of content you get here. The fact the designer actually said, you know what, I'm going to design basically six mini quests for this one mini adventure thing and really expand on what you can do for the Quarreds. And I think that just does an awesome job of expanding that area and goes way above and beyond what I would expect it to do. I expected like one of these style missions for this area, but instead this one was impressive. Probably honestly one of the most impressive out of all nine of these uh, expansion you know, each bundle included three adventures, so nine total, but this is probably one of my favorite out of all nine of those. Um, which isn't to say that Mill in the Mist is bad. I think Mill in the Mist is just fine. Uh, in this case, I'm actually going to show you my Roll20 screen for a second so you can see where this one is. So let me click on over to that for a hot second. All right, so here is the uh, Roll20. This is what the domain of Prismir looks like as it's divided up. You can see hither, thither, and yawn over here. In fact, that Astronomer's Throne... Uh, you can see where my mouse is. is there's a better, I can go to the other map, but whatever. Um, so this is the mill. So what this one posits is, again, it throws up another obstacle because normally it says, okay, once you've basically gotten a mother horn and you have, uh, you know, defeated the hag and you've got the, the balloon, you can just go to the Palace of Heart's Desire. And this says, well, wait a minute, wait, instead of immediately doing that, maybe you have to make this other stop because there are these magical mists that are being generated that actually help keep these all three of these regions because you notice they act as a barrier and that's the reason why you can't you always have to like solve that uh regions um basically defeat the hag and, and find the one like npc that can bring you to each region uh because you can't normally cross these uh, mists it's like curse of strahd type mists so you can actually go to this mill in the middle so the designer just said hey there's this random mill that's on this map and i'm gonna decide to make this into an, its own adventure um, and that's the mill and the whole purpose of this thing is it actually does keep these mists here. So if you can go here and disable it, then all of a sudden, not only do you free the way to the palace, but you've essentially really opened up the entire map. It's like being at the end of a video game where suddenly you've got free reign, you know, over the whole zone. I don't see a reason why you'd have to revisit earlier places, but it's an interesting obstacle. So in other words, instead of being able to go immediately from Motherhorn into the Palace of Heart's Desire, you have to first go to this mill in the mists. So we will return to... Uh, that screen to talk about the mill in the mists, which this one, I do wish there was a little bit more involved here. It's it's fine. Um, so the backstory here is pretty nice, which is the a, uh, a Fomorian, which is this the hideous kind of cursed giant people, uh, went to the hag and said, make me pretty. And the hag said, no problem. Of course, I'll do that. I'm a straight shooter. Uh, hags don't actually say that. Uh, instead, she tricked, as she does, uh, the Fomorian and said, okay, well, if you crank the giant wheel on this mill every day, which will be enough to keep the mists in here, then I will make you beautiful. But what she actually does is she enchants the mirror she gives the Fomorian and, say, and the mirror just shows you uh, the most beautiful vision of you that you could conjure up by looking into the mirror. So uh, that's an obviously easy way that the players can deal with the Fomorian socially once they reach there is by saying, oh, well, all of us looked great in the mirror, but obviously you look hideous and, you know, you can pretty much figure things out from there. Assuming the party can, the, the one thing that can screw them up is if they can't communicate because he does speak giant. So if they lack that p communication, then it's just a fight. Then they have to fight him as like a boss of this area. Otherwise, it can be a social encounter if they feel like they can communicate with him. But before that, I'm getting a little ahead of things. Before that, it actually expands on a section of the Motherhorn Dungeon, which is finding the balloon and the darklings that are working the balloon. It says, hey, here's how you could get the balloon. And here are, you know, with different um, skill checks or, or money you could purchase it for or even a fight if you want to have to fight these darklings. Um, and then here's the travel for the balloon, which notice we get this really cool balloon map, which is awesome because that would motivate me to do encounters because you've got this vehicle that you're, you know, going over these stormy mists and into the mill. Uh, and there's all these different complications that can occur, mechanical issues, turbulence. Uh, the mists could come in and really screw things up. And if they all require a skill check, and if you fail that skill check, then you roll on an encounter table, which means the mists could just come up and cast Crown of Madness on you. A living cloud kill spell could come in and really do some damage because you've got nowhere to go. Uh, or you could just have a creature spawn in, like the, a cloaker could come in and really do some damage as well, which again, you're you know level six or seven, so even one of those can can really screw up your day. So I love the fact that we got this really fancy, cool map and, that, and uh, what amounts to actually cool encounters that are very flavorful whereas a lot of times i'm kind of down on random and uh, travel encounters just because they usually just a time sink and they don't add a lot to the experience whereas here i think it's very memorable to have fun encounters while traveling on a balloon and then the actual mill is basically kind of a, a just a tower dungeon map but there's not a whole lot going on here in terms of exploration or puzzles or combat 
there's a little bit of like presence here because I guess the Darklings send them presents, but there a lot of them are just bullshit like traps. So it's the players can start opening presents and bad things will happen to them. They probably do that once. One person goes, oh, I rip open those presents. Like, okay, well, wait a minute. Let me roll on the table a few times and, you know, a living doll emerges or, you know, whatever bad things else happens. Marsh gas comes popping out of there and poisons you. Um, the main thing is they realize the whole uh, magic mirror thing. There's a little bit of a puzzle to solve, but it's not much of one. It's more about, hey, did you explore the, find the numbers and the panel and put the numbers in the right spot? And that opens up the true stairs to get to the third floor where you encounter the Fomorian and then have that event. And really it comes down to whether you can speak giant or not. Because I feel like if you communicate with the giant, you can very quickly tell him like, hey, you're, no, you're still hideous. Like you don't look good at all. It's the, and the mirror made us look good. Like it's, you know, I think it'd be pretty easy to convince him to even be an ally and obviously to stop turning the crank every day. And then that will very quickly start um, receding all of the mist. So I think it does a, a pretty good job at what it's trying to do. I, I maybe wish the tower was a little more involved and a little more interesting, but that's a pretty minor complaint, I think, in the grand scheme of things. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for this whole Yawn Adventure Bundle. Pro, it effectively expands Chapter 4 of The Wild Beyond the Witchlight with fun side ventures and meaningful tie-ins. Yes, I think I've used the exact same pro for all three of these adventure bundles, but that rings true in the fact that I list... I like the concept and design of these entire bundles, the fact that it takes areas that are uh, very underdeveloped and could use some more work, which is exactly what I do, is I take, um, you know, existing official campaigns and then just hack and homebrew the shit out of all these little areas here and there and make them more interesting. That's exactly what's going on here. So I think that's amazing. Pro full color gridded and gridless maps for each location. We get even more locations here than most of the adventures because of all the ones that are including the Cord Clan. So all of these different uh, maps right here are all uh, individual uh, maps that we can use in our adventures. So that's amazing. We probably get the best amount of handouts. In fact, that's another pro I have is the interactive handout or map for sliding for the sliding tile cube and constellation puzzles. Uh, we get separate maps for those. And that, again, especially as someone who wrote, you know runs all these adventures on a VTT, that really motivates me to use these puzzles when I can use them as visual aids is a huge help. And I think this has... Uh, by far just the best puzzles in general. I didn't remember any standout puzzles from the first two bundles, so very much thumbs up on that. And then the other pro is a helpful troubleshooting notes if the party fails any steps of these mini adventures, something I kind of glossed over, but there's basically a little section um, at the end of each of these uh, called troubleshooting that's basically like, hey, if your party you know, uh, fails to do this step or they fail at, or maybe the there's one in the middle of the mist where, hey, if that cloaker encounter destroys the the... the uh, the hot air balloon because of the rain cloud balloon, because that could happen, like maybe have it, you know, towards the end of the adventure. And then if they go down, then you can just have them spin out of control and fall them into hither, but then they could go and get another balloon. Like basically it just helps you as a DM try to course correct things. If the players fail too hard at something and allows them to try to fail forward rather than obviously being a game over because, uh, you cannot load your game in D and D. All right. Uh, and cons, Honestly, none. Like, I had a little bit of nitpicks here and there with a few adventures, but nothing that really stood out, at least compared to the other adventure bundles. I think by far this was probably the one I was overall most impressed with. Granted, a big part of that was how much I was impressed with Cord Clan specifically, but still, uh, no major cons on this one. Final verdict, as with the previous adventure bundles, Yawn Adventure Bundle expands and enhances the Wild Beyond the Witchlight with an excellent assortment of role-playing, combat, puzzles, and memorable moments. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel and support my work, please, at patreon.com slash roguewatson. Thank you.